Church. It's such a joy to have you in our online church experience. Um, each of us have had a different kind of week, but I want to bring all of us to the common point of God's word. Reading from Isaiah chapter nine, verse six: For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I don't know about you, but I th- I personally have needed all of these attributes of God in the past week. I've needed Him to be my Father. I've needed Him to give me peace. I've needed Him to counsel me. I've needed His might to carry me. And so I want to encourage you as you head into this next week, as you sit in the service, that you will experience God for all that He is. That you would invite Him in, and as we worship together, that you would experience Him one more time. Let's worship together. It's just amazing to uh, meet you all online one more time, and it's the most wonderful time of the year. We can say because uh, this is believed that Christ was born in December, and we celebrate him the most in December. I feel, and uh, uh, let's just uh, start by saying, "Joyful, joyful, we adore thee." Along with joy to the world. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ, while fields and floods, rocks, hills and plains repeat the sounding joy. Repeat the sounding joy. Repeat, repeat the sounding. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love wonders of his love and wonders wonders of his love joyful joyful we adore thee god of glory god of love hearts unfold like Flash before the opening to the sun above. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ while fields and floods, rocks, Repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. And a Messiah is born just for you and I. And uh, you know, we don't have to really do anything for Him. He's already done it. And uh, God gave His only Son just for you and I. And uh, He paid it all for us. 
for all that we've done, for all the sins that we've done. He's taken it on him. And he's our ransom. Let's just make it a point that we celebrate Christ every single day and not only during Christmas. He's the savior of all mankind. Whether you're a Hindu, whether you're a Muslim, whether you're a Christian, it really doesn't matter. But He wants to save you and He loves you just the way you are. No matter your skin tone, doesn't even matter to Him. He's made you in His image. And that's the beauty of this God whom we serve and whom we celebrate. I'm long awaited, precious promise. Of God and Son of Man, oh, heaven's glory in a manger has come to us in Bethlehem, Messiah. verses 1 to 3 says come let us sing for joy to the Lord let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation let us come before him with thanksgiving 
and extol him with music and song for the lord is the great god the great king above all gods let's just uh, worship with all of our hearts wherever we are at if you want to lift your hands up or if you want to just kneel and just cry out to him say lord we want to come before you we want to humble ourselves before you be the lord over our lives give you the rightful place in our lives we humble ourselves we bow before you and offer ourselves as living sacrifices holy and pleasing unto you lord take control over our lives we love you in jesus name we pray amen Father we just thank you for this time we thank you for all that you had are doing in our lives we're so grateful father that you have loved us with an everlasting love and right now father we lift every request up to your throne of grace knowing that you hear us knowing that you are faithful to your word knowing that you keep your promises father Lord right now as a church we lift up Gifty to your throne of grace we just ask oh father that you would envelop her with your presence that lord you would carry her through this season that you would heal Lord everything that needs healing in her life in her body I pray oh father god that you would restore her lord to each one of us father we thank you that you are moving right now in that hospital room we thank you that you are with her and we pray very specially holy spirit that you would strengthen her that you would empower her that you will speak to her and that lord you will prepare her for all that is to come oh father i pray for others right now who are watching this who are having a sickness in their body lord who have been struggling in their minds with something father i pray that they will lay the burden down they will let you be god i pray that they will experience the saving power of emmanuel 
the saving power of Jesus the Christ. I pray, O oh Father, that they will let go of fear, they will let go of worry, and embrace all that You are. Father, I pray right now for our nation. I pray for the needs of our land. I pray for the wisdom for our leaders, for our governing authorities. Father, we just pray that you will protect women and children across the land, O oh Father. We pray, O oh Father, that the Church of Jesus would rise up in this land in unity, O oh Father. That, Lord, we will not stop praying. We will not stop interceding for our people, O oh Father God. We pray for the nations of the earth. I pray, Lord, for the nations that have been torn with war, Lord, with strife. Lord, who have been affected by natural calamities, we just pray your protection and presence in those places. I pray, O oh Father, that in those places, those who know you will be like shining lights. Those who know you, Lord, will be powerful witnesses of your love, of your care, of your compassion. Father, even as we worship you, even as we hear your word, we just pray that, Lord, you will speak to each one of us personally. We thank you that you love us so deeply and we pray that we will experience your love in this season. We commit all this into your mighty hands. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So church, as you know, we've been doing a, a series just for Advent called Recapturing Glory. And today we are in part three of that. And we look forward to you hearing the word. We believe it's, it's a very powerful word, one that is necessary for us in this season. So can I just urge you to put aside every distraction and lean in and hear what the Holy Spirit has for us Hello, today. Everyone. I am so glad to be with you again. So we're in the midst of our Advent series uh, called Recapturing Glory. So we have done uh, the first two, I mean, uh, messages, which was Glory in the Dirt and then Glory in the Supernatural. And today, uh, our message today is titled Glory in the Ordinary. So we will get into that in just a bit. Before we start, I'm going to go ahead and say a quick word of prayer, and then we'll go from there. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us this time, as always, Lord, that uh, we can gather in safety we can gather in peace and we can gather around your name lord so father we thank you for giving us that privilege and as we enjoy that privilege and uh, give you thanks and gratitude for that we think about the people that are not able to do that even this advent season when they want to celebrate your first coming and they're looking forward to your second coming lord that they may not be able to gather as a community of faith uh, because of the circumstances in their life or their country, Lord. Lord, we ask that uh, you would bring about change, that your good will be continue to work in that place, Lord, and that uh, all those people that may now be are being persecuted would be free to gather and uh, to worship you and to gather again in your name, Lord. And uh, Father, right now we also think about our church member Gifty. Uh, we ask that, Lord, no, we know that you are with her. We ask that you would comfort her, that uh, you would give her solace and comfort and relief from the pain that she's going through. We ask that uh, you would uh, speed up the recovering and healing process, that you would give everyone gathered around her wisdom um, to go about a treatment that you would fill the people around her with empathy, Lord, to care for her, whether it's the people in the morning or the people in the night, Lord. Let them be filled with the kindness and care for her, Lord, and uh, let them take care of her the best way possible. Father. So, Lord, we commit that into your hands. We know that uh, you're in control, and we know that you're the one that is uh, walking by gifty side, leading her through this, Lord. And, Father, we thank you again for the chance we have to celebrate the first time you came and to look forward and hope for the second time that you will come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we are getting into the third uh, message in the series called Glory in the Ordinary. And the scripture passage we have for this message is Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. So as many of you might know that this is uh, the birth of Jesus as uh, Luke uh, narrates it for us. It's, it is the most detailed birth account of Jesus' birth that we have. Um, Matthew gives us a couple verses. Uh, John and Mark really don't speak that much about it, but Luke is the one that gives us a more detailed narrative of what happened around the birth of Jesus. So um, I will read that in just a moment. Before that, um, the series is titled Recapturing Glory. 
Um, we've talked about glory in the dirt, uh, glory in the supernatural, and today it's glory in the ordinary. So I kind of want to set the tone as to what um, I mean in terms of glory today. So glory, quite literally, when the word is translated in the Hebrew in the Old Testament, which is the word is kavod, it, it literally means weight, this immense weight. Like people couldn't stand because of the weight of this. So God's glory is literally means weight. It is... Uh, the weight of all that God is, in a sense. Uh, it is the weight of his magnificence, his grandeur, his loveliness, um, his worth. So it is the entire weight of all that God is. Uh, weight that you can't get up. Weight that uh, if it were on you, all you could be is laying on the floor. So glory is this uh, weight, and it's the weight of all that God is. So just keep that in your mind as we talk about uh, towards the end, what this glory in the ordinary might mean for us. So I'm going to go ahead and read our scripture passage, and then we'll get into it. So this is Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, and I'm reading from the NIV. Uh, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. So this is Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. So many of you may have heard the story. Many of you have an idea of probably what you thought happened. Um, so many of you have seen enough movies to go through the tension and uh, the drama that uh, probably happened here, or at least what we've been told happened here. But I want to be very upfront with you. I'm going to give you a very different perspective on the birth of Jesus today. Um, it is uh, not one that is filled with a lot of drama. It is not one that really has any tension built in. Um, it is a very simple, mundane, ordinary birth story. Uh, so, but I want to be upfront. It is probably going to be a very different perspective from what you have learned. Um, I am not really here to try and trying to convince you that this is the right way. What I'm here is I'm here sharing uh, what I've learned through my study and reading about prepping for this uh, message. So it's going to be a very different perspective. Um, and we'll get that in just a little bit. So glory in the ordinary. What is so ordinary here, right? So we start out, um, Luke talks about a census that's been taken for the entire Roman world. So Caesar Augustus, the emperor of Rome, some call the first emperor of Rome, has uh, declared that there is to be a census that is going to take place of the entire Roman world, which at this point was pretty much a lot of the known world because Rome was a very extensive, expansive empire at this time. So what is the point of a census, right? Most of the time, a census is taken so you can account for everybody that is in your kingdom so they can be taxed. So you know that you are collecting taxes from every eligible person. Uh, it could also mean uh, that uh, it could, another purpose it would be is for people to be conscripted or drafted into the army to serve in the Roman army. Um, however, the Jewish people were exempt. They had a special exempt exemption uh, from being conscripted. So the only purpose of this year is pretty much to be taxed. So you can give to Caesar what is due to Caesar. So um, when this decree comes out, uh, Joseph decides, he picks up his bag and takes Mary and decides to go to his hometown of Bethlehem, right? All sounds very ordinary. We all pay taxes. When there are new tax laws, we don't revolt, we comply, right? We are ordinary people, whether we enjoy paying taxes or not, we know that's something that is right. And so we do it. Uh, taxes, very ordinary and something very ordinary for Joseph to do. Um, he wasn't extraordinary like in some others at this time. Some of the Jewish people, when the consensus, when the decree for the consensus was 
uh, sent out, they were reminded uh, that they were still under Roman oppression, that they were being occupied by this foreign power, and that led them to revolt. Um, this is not the case here. Joseph and Mary have not joined a revolt. They realize, like most of us, that we are subordinate to the government authority, that when they do something, that we are obedient. So they are subordinate, they comply, they obey, and they do this ordinary thing of just following the law that has just been laid and going to go get themselves registered, right? So, I mean, the names of uh, the... So they go to get registered. So very simple, very ordinary. Uh, one very interesting thing to note is that uh, Luke mentions the word register, like in the first five verses, he, it's mentioned like four times. The only verse that doesn't have the word register in it is verse four. So verse one, two, three, and five have this repetitive word register. Like Luke wants us to know that this birth story of Jesus is happening in space and time, as in it happened in history, nothing outside of history, like this really happened. It wasn't a once upon a time fairy tale. It was this happened when Caesar Augustus was emperor. This happened while Quirinius was governor of Syria, right? And this happened in Bethlehem. So he's almost giving us like this world perspective, like the whole empire has to go through a census and then he's narrowing it down to the small town, backwater town in Bethlehem. So he's making sure we understand that this took place in history, not outside of history, not a made up story. This was truth that took place in history and he's giving us markers in history so that we understand that this did take place. So now, now, now we get into uh, the parts that in your mind might be being filled with tension, right? So normally, at least I thought, so my perspective before I was preparing for this was what I've heard throughout my life, right? I've seen the, the nativity stories. I've seen the cartoon the animated stories, the live action stories, I've seen many of them, right? And this journey is filled with drama and tension. So normally, at least what um, my perspective of this story was that, so Mary is very likely uh, pretty much 39 and a half weeks pregnant. She's full term, she's on a donkey, and they travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And then they get into Bethlehem in the middle of the night. They're knocking from door to door, looking for a place to stay. And everyone is rude and mean and turns them away, right? And uh, they go to the inn, knock and the innkeeper is this rude person who comes out and yells, there is no place to stay, get away. So, and they turn away this husband and this full term pregnant lady, right? And then, so they go away and then either there is this, aha moment or a light shining from heaven on this uh, stable or barn and then joseph has the bright idea you know what maybe this is where it's going to be so they go into this barn or the stable surrounded by animals and joseph is the only one there and then jesus arrives on the scene and uh, he's this calm quiet baby that mary's holding and it is that silent holy night uh, kind of picture that everything is calm, everything is quiet, and the only people involved are Mary, Joseph, and Jesus when he arrives, and the animals looking around. So, from what I've read, this drama and tension is really not there in scripture. Um, we have it because we have heard it, we have seen it on television. Uh, however, scripture doesn't really portray this tension and this drama in this picture, okay? And one of the main reasons is when you look at verse five, I'm sorry, when you look at verse six, it starts out while they were there, as in they have been in Bethlehem for some time now, not while, not when they arrived, she was ready to give birth, not uh, as soon or when they got there, it was while they were there, as in it paints a picture that Joseph and Mary have been staying in Bethlehem for a little bit or for a while. So it wasn't this um, frantic, uh, hurried journey into Bethlehem in the middle of the night to make sure they find a place to stay 
and knocking on doors to see. It was they've already been there and they've been staying there. So if they've been so if they have been there and staying there, they had a place to stay, right? So what where were they staying? So Bethlehem is uh, Joseph's um, hometown, right? So he was going back to his hometown. He was going back to the town that his ancestors are from. And it is very likely that they were staying in the ancestral home. And you're probably like, how can you say that, Jaron? Because it clearly says in verse 7 that there was no place for them in the inn. Or as uh, the NIV puts it, there was no room for them in the guest room. So let me read that again once I find the page. So it says, at the end of verse 7, she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Some of your translations may say there was no room for them in the end. Um, but as I was reading, what I found out was the word in really isn't a very appropriate, accurate translation for the Greek word that um, is used in the original text. Um, because um, Luke uses the word in in other parts of scripture, and that's not the same word he uses in Luke chapter 2. So in is really not the right word for this context here. It is also very unlikely that this small backwater town of Bethlehem had any place like an inn. It was not at any major uh, crossroads or by any major trading routes or by any major road, really. So there was really no reason to house travelers. And if there were travelers passing through, they very likely were just um, staying out in the open in a group like a caravan. Um, so one thing, very likely Bethlehem really didn't have an inn. And two, this is really not, the word is best not translated as in. Um, so sometimes translators use the word guest room. Uh, that gets closer to what Luke was really trying to say. Uh, but uh, what might be the closest way to look at this is uh, uh, the phrase uh, place to stay. So in other words, the best way to read the end of Luke might be that there was no space in their place to stay. As in, so she wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no space in their place to stay. As in, they were already in a place, but there was no space there. So now let's get back to this, right? So it was not an inn. So they were staying somewhere and then they kind of ran out of space. So back to Joseph. He's in Bethlehem. Very likely he had an ancestral home that uh, he was staying in. Uh, another reason for this, apart from just the fact that this was his hometown, um, Judaic weddings uh, during this first century time, uh, they were initiated with the engagement ceremony uh, and then they were culminated uh, with uh, what is called a home taking, as in the husband takes his uh, engaged, uh, his fiance to his uh, home. And that culminates the wedding and she becomes his wife. So it is likely that that is also what's happening here, that Joseph is using this opportunity of the census to take Mary home uh, so that uh, what has been initiated with the engagement can be culminated in the home taking. And so in this setting, Joseph is taking Mary home. And so there would be a place for them to stay at in his ancestral home. Uh, so the way that um, these uh, village homes were built, um, archaeologists have found out that most of these village homes, they had a main floor. There was a large living room, uh, but it also had additional rooms added on. Um, many times they were called marital chambers, as in for specific reasons as to a son uh, comes home with his wife and they had they needed an additional room to house this new family. So they would add on these chambers either to the side of the house or to the top of the house. So just small cramped quarters for a couple to stay in. Uh, so, and archaeologists have found that 
houses in this setting, in this village setting, in uh, these times, sometimes were two stories, some were even three stories. So there were add-ons to the main um, home that was done. So, and also the main floor served two purposes, right? So the main floor was almost like a split level. There were two uh, distinct areas that were separated in elevation by about a meter. There was a lower level and an upper level. The humans stayed in the upper level and the animals stayed in the lower level. Yes, animals and humans were housed in the same place. Uh, we have this idea of barn or stable because in our recent memory, animals are always housed separately from anybody else. Uh, however, in this setting, uh, the humans and the animals were kind of housed under the same roof. There was this slight separation in elevation. Uh, so the animals were housed in the lower level and in the same area, but in a slightly higher elevation, about three feet, right? A meter. The humans had their living room, their living space. Um, so this is likely what happened, right? So the census uh, is announced. So David has to go, sorry, Joseph has to go to Bethlehem anyway. So he takes Mary so that he can have the home taking where their marriage can be culminated, uh, wedding can be culminated. So he takes her home to his ancestral home. Uh, they are staying in one of these tiny bedrooms called marital chambers uh, in his ancestral home. So there are probably people living there as well, the people that normally live in his home because he lives in Nazareth or other people traveling in uh, for the census like, uh, like he just did. So there were people living there in that house and he is probably occupying one of these uh, marital chambers because he's just uh, brought home his um, new wife. And so while they were there, they have been staying there. This is likely the setting that they've been staying, right? So again, no frantic search for the inn, but just a calm stay with family. And during the stay, it is time for the baby to be born, okay? So it's time for the baby to be born. So, and she gave birth to a son. And then it says that there was, she wrapped him in placement manger because there was no space in their place to stay. So what does this mean? So like I mentioned, marital chambers are very cramped, small quarters. So there was really no room in this marital chamber to deliver a baby for other people to be there to help. So what likely happened was that she was, that Mary was moved from the marital chamber to the living room where there was ample space. This living room that houses humans and animals on the lower level, right? So she's brought to the living room because you need space. You're going to have people around you when you are giving birth, especially when you're in this family home, right? Uh, giving birth in that time was the most perilous part of your entire pregnancy because um, it was the time that... Um, both mother and child could be affected, they could die. So you wanted people around, you wanted midwives around. So there were likely people around Mary helping her through this process. So they moved her from the marital chamber, moved her to the living area or the living room. So there is space, right? And then so in the midst of this ordinary birth in first century Judea taking place, Jesus comes into the world and they need a place to put them so they get the manger the manger is literally a feeding trough why do they have access to a manger because they were on the same floor as the animals that were being housed so manger was readily available they said okay why not put them in a manger so the manger i mean it was a feeding uh trough for animals so i'm sure it was messy and sticky maybe they cleaned it out we don't know but Jesus is laid in the manger and he's wrapped in clothes, right? So again, this event has no drama, no tension, right? It is a pretty normal, regular birth that would most likely happen to almost all people in that setting. Uh, you would be at home, you'd be giving birth, surrounded by midwives or women or people from your family because they would be there to support to make sure everything goes okay because this was a perilous time and so a very 
ordinary drama, less tension, less event, a regular childbirth in this first century setting, right? So very mundane, very ordinary. Even more ordinary is the fact that it was probably not a very silent night. Holy, yes, but not silent because there were definitely screams from labor and definitely a crying baby when he was born. Uh, not a baby like we have in our Christmas carols where they say no crying he makes. He was a regular fully God yet fully human. So he was a fully human baby. He came with all the needs that a human babies do. And there were lots of noise, Mary and then Jesus, right? So a very, very ordinary birth. So how is there any glory in what I've just told you is more plain and ordinary than you had probably imagined before. So how is there glory in the ordinary? Well, one thing is that even in this ordinary thing, we think that it was initiated by Caesar Augustus, the emperor. You, we might think that it was Caesar in control, using, issuing a decree to um, put everything in this entire uh, world in motion as far as a census. But it really is God working in the background, God working things out so that his plan of salvation comes to fulfillment so that the prophecy surrounding Jesus is fulfilled. Like it is God in the background working out history so that there is a census and that, that draws Joseph from Nazareth to Bethlehem and then that Jesus is born in Bethlehem to fulfill prophecy, right? Because Jesus is supposed to come from the house of David uh, and uh, David's town is Bethlehem. And uh, so it is, even though this seems mundane and ordinary to us that it was taxes that pulled these people from Nazareth to Bethlehem and it was just a decree from an authority figure and that they had to obey. Um, what we can't miss is that God is at work in the background. Even in this, what seems like ordinary thing, it was God at work, God controlling history to bring about his plan of salvation. So God is at work in the background. And two, through this normal childbirth, the most pivotal thing in human history happens, right? Through this normal childbirth, the savior of the world comes into our world. The savior of the world is born. Nothing extraordinary. Mary still went through nine months of pregnancy. And there was no quick fix where she was pregnant instantly and she gave birth without pain and everything was fine. No. Through this ordinary event that Mary had to take the whole time, uh, Jesus was born, right? The event that would that started God's restoration of his entire creation started with this ordinary thing. Like through this ordinary birth in this ordinary setting, God had started his work of restoration. Uh, the most glorious thing that has happened in history came through this ordinary childbirth, right? So the God is working in the ordinary, right? There's almost as if there is no ordinary because what seems like an ordinary decree from an emperor to make sure he's collecting taxes is not ordinary because God is the one that's orchestrating that to bring about his work. It seems like an ordinary childbirth uh, in an ordinary setting of a, uh, of a Judean village in that time. It was not ordinary because the savior of the world came into the world through this ordinary event. So these glorious things are happening through ordinary things. So what does it mean for us? Like, what does it mean for us? It means that God is at work even in the ordinary things in our life. Uh, it means that the ordinary things in our life have worth and value because God is at work in them. Just like he was at work in the ordinary things that we see in the uh, birth narrative of Jesus, he is at work in the ordinary things in our life. So 
everything, the ordinary things we do have significance. Um, the ordinary things we do um, showcase to other people that God is at work. When, so I think God is calling us to give importance to the ordinary things in our life. When we take those moments to sit and spend time with our spouse and have a conversation, what seems ordinary, uh, but God is working in that ordinary situation, right? Um, when you take a moment and you sit and spend time with your child and you stop doing something that you feel is important, but you sit and do the ordinary thing of being with your child, God is working through that ordinary thing. When you share a meal with a coworker and maybe you just have a random mundane conversation, ordinary things, but God is working through that ordinary thing. In our lives, we go through so many things we consider ordinary, so many things that we feel like we can do without because we want to be extraordinary or we want to be better. However, God is at work. There is, he is not only at work in the big things. He is not only at work in the big productions and in the things that we think are extraordinary. He is not only at work in the big projects that we do at work that take our attention. He is at work in the very little mundane things in our life. He is at work in the conversations we have. He is at work in the text messages we send. He is at work in the time that we spend with people. He is constantly at work in the ordinary. He is at work when you're in the gas station and you ask the attendant who is helping you fill your tank, how are they doing? Or you just smile. He is at work in the most ordinary things in our life because he is God and he's orchestrating all things for his good. So he is at work in those things. So that means that we, the ordinary things become important to us. So now, even though these things are ordinary, they are no longer unimportant, but they are important because our God is at work in those ordinary things. So just like he brought about the most glorious thing in human history through this ordinary childbirth in a Judean village, God will bring about glorious things in the ordinary things that we do. And uh, let's just have that perspective as we go through this week. Thank you so much for giving me t uh, the chance to share with you. I hope uh, you have a wonderful week. Uh, let me pray as uh, we close out. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time. Thank you that uh, you are in our midst, even in the ordinary things that are done that you are ever present and in the ordinary things that you are working Lord, You're working in the times that we spend with people, in the conversations that we have, in the smiles that we share, Lord, in everything you are at work, Lord. So Father, help us to not discount the ordinary, Lord. Help us not to only look for the extraordinary things, but help us to keep our eyes on the ordinary and know that you are at work and uh, Show us the value and the worth uh, and the significance of the ordinary things that we're a part of. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So church, even as we heard, even in the most ordinary things of our life, it could be just a conversation with someone we love. It could be just that text. It could be anything ordinary. But God is working right, right there. He meets us there and he works through those ordinary moments. So can I just encourage you not to discount the ordinary, that the ordinary parts of your life can be glorious if we are conscious of God moving and working in those moments. Even as we get into the next week, it's the week of Christmas. Can I just urge you to um, look outside of yourself, look at the needs around you, serve where you can, because that's where we can really um, bring Jesus to earth again, as it were. He's already with us, but you could bring Jesus into someone's life just by you spending time with them or giving of yourself. So um, this coming week, we'll again meet on Christmas day for our online service. If you're in Chennai, you'd like to be in person with the rest of our community, we meet on 24th evening for our Christmas Eve service. We'd love to have you there. Most importantly, remember this, that whoever finds Jesus finds life. God bless you.